My name is Rob. I organize Idea to IPO. We've been doing events in Silicon Valley for many, many years. We hold events multiple times a week from San Jose to San Francisco. We always have a busy, busy calendar of events. I want to highlight a few events that are coming up. July 11th, How to Successfully Pitch to Investors and Get Funded, featuring angel investor Gary Jinks. That's going to be in this room. July 18th, How to Implement a Successful Exit Strategy. That's featuring Roger Royce. That's going to be in this room. July 25th, we have a venture capital panel, investment and latest innovations in AI. That's going to be at the College of San Mateo. So check out the details for those events and all of our events on our website, ideatoipo.com. We launched officially on February 1st, 2010. At that time, we had no members and no events on our calendar. At this stage, we have over 60,000 members among all our meetup groups in the Bay Area. We've completed over 2,100 events, that many. We're I was supposed to say we're the most active, most prolific startup event organization in Silicon Valley, bar none. Then you're supposed to apply. <laughs> hey guys, your timing's off today, that's okay. Our mission is to promote entrepreneurship, support entrepreneurs, build community, and provide value in the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. To that end, we provide content that's practical, actionable, and relevant, stuff that you can actually use to succeed as entrepreneurs. We believe in building community because Silicon Valley is an aspirational ecosystem. It attracts people from all over the world who come here to do great things. Who here is not originally from Silicon Valley or the Bay Area? Who here was born and raised in Silicon Valley or the Bay Area? Wow. No. We've got a lot of... A lot of natives today. Uh, well, anyway, welcome. So whether you were born and raised here or just arrived last night, it's important for us to provide multiple channels for you to meet people, build relationships, and grow your network. In addition to our content-oriented events, we also have some fun events on Friday nights. And our next Friday night event is July 12th, TGIF Mixer at the Hyatt Regency Santa Clara. So you're all invited. That's a free event. Again, check out the details on our website, ideatoipo.com. We have many, many partners to help us do what we do. Law firms, venture capital firms, angel investor groups, incubators, accelerators, colleges, universities, lots of players in Silicon Valley. Tonight, we're grateful to SVI Hub for hosting us at this beautiful venue. Is this a beautiful venue? Yeah. Yes, it's a beautiful venue. So let's hear it for SVI Hub and Sirlar, applause. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I would like to give you some information about uh, Silicon Valley Ignite. So we do have some uh, major services for mostly startup founders, especially international folks who want to enter to the Silicon Valley. And the first and most important service is uh, Silicon Valley Ignite Academy, SVI Academy. Uh, we offer trainings, workshops, and we do have a flagship uh, program, which is called Gateway to Silicon Valley, one-week program that people get some actionable insights and where they can meet like more than 25 different speakers. And also we do offer like uh, business development services because some of the startups uh, are not that interested in training or learning new things. They are more interested in execution and having someone uh, in their team do this business development execution for them. So we do offer them uh, business development execution. And Accelerator uh, is another service that we provide and also we offer uh, SVI corporate innovation uh, services. One of the investors of SVI is a multinational company which is called Sador. They do have operations in 35 to 40 different countries and they're in touch with multiple uh, large corporations and eventually in October uh, between 21st and 25th for four days, we are gonna host like 15 large corporations from all over Europe. They're gonna stay here for three to four days and they are here to see the Silicon Valley ecosystem. And also we are gonna arrange some one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with some hand-picked startups because they also wanted to meet with some startups either to make investments or to create some partnerships. And SVI Hub is the place that we offer all these services basically. So in a nutshell, SVI Hub is the co-working space and under SVI Hub, we offer corporate innovation, accelerator, business development, and academy 
and this location has been like two months and we are planning to open like two more locations next one is going to be in palo alto and hopefully another one in san francisco and we do have a special day for today please ask bara for the details and enjoy your evening yeah have a good one a few of our other partners are here tonight i would also like to have them come up and say a few words uh, next up, let's hear it for Bridget and S5 Advisory. Applause. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll just do a quick intro. My name is Bridget Fahey. I'm with S5 Advisory. We're a full-service commercial brokerage firm. Um, our office is actually just around the corner on Great America Parkway. Uh, and I specialize in advising companies with their space needs. We work with a number of groups from early stage startups um, all the way up to Fortune 500 companies. So any questions you may have regarding leasing space for your business, purchasing, um, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. <laughs> right. Next up, we have Anita from Happiness Factors. Applause. <laughs> Thank you, Rob, for always giving us the opportunity to talk about our startups. So I'm Anita Kumari. I'm the founder and chief strategist at Happiness Factors. And we specialize in creating happy mindsets and happiness without the use of drugs, marijuana, or alcohol. <laughs> and you see, he's already complaining. But once you know the techniques we use, you will even think, why did I ever use any other method to be happy? So you use NLP, hypnotherapy, MER, past life regression, and lots of energy and other ancient techniques to create the software, which is in MVP phase. We do lots of workshops. We have an award-winning book on happiness called Find Your Happy, available on Amazon, as well as we do lots of keynotes and workshops uh, here in the Bay Area, as well as uh, in different corporations and in the different chambers of commerce. And last month, I spoke to around 1,000 people about how to have the balance between use of technology and increase your happiness in your life. Thank you. What about ice cream? Yeah. <laughs> okay, though our local mission is to support entrepreneurs here in Silicon Valley, our greater global mission is to democratize entrepreneurship and innovation all around the world. To that end, we maintain a robust YouTube channel, youtube.com slash idea to IPO. Go check it out. We have tons of videos there. We've documented and archived many, many of our events. And this rich, valuable content is available on demand, anytime, anywhere, totally free of charge. Whether you're in Sunnyvale, Palo Alto, San Francisco, New York, LA, Maui, Moscow, or Timbuktu. Our partner in this endeavor is Tim Jaggers of Jaggers Films, the most well, he's actually the top professional videographer, in my opinion, in Silicon Valley. So let's give it up for Tim. Applause. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rob. So I'm Tim. Uh, I've been doing most of the videos for Idea to IPO over the past several years. Uh, I do a lot of other events. I do promotional content, uh, I shoot weddings, I do real estate. I do all kinds of stuff, so if you have any questions relative to media production, specifically photo and audio, I'm sorry, photo and video, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I've got cards in the front, and I'll be around after the event as well. And uh, thanks again for having us. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, here's the schedule for the rest of the evening. Our featured speaker will present. He's got an awesome slide deck. Audience members, hold your questions until 8 p.m. At that point, we're going to open it up to questions. We want to take as many questions as possible. We're going to pass the mic around to make sure we have a clean audio for our video, make sure we have a great learning tool we can all use uh, for a long, long time. At 8.30 p.m., we're going to wrap up the formal program. You can talk to Dr. Earl one-on-one, -on -one, network, socialize, and connect. As a courtesy to SVI Hub, we would like to leave the building about 9 p.m. So our featured speaker tonight is a thought leader, a distinguished academic, a published author, and a dynamic speaker. So let's give it up for Dr. Earl Warsenga. Applause. Thank you. OK. Today I'm going to try to convince you that in today's world of big data, our common sense and logic could use some help. 
And hopefully what I'm about to present today will help you make better defensible decisions. So it's about creating belief that when you go from here, then you'll have some belief that you learned something of value and that you could use it. So I want to start with an apology because I'm in the USA about political correctness, right? Me, I have a multicultural background, so please excuse me if I say something that's not in tune with what's happening here. And also, most of my material is for the international arena, so there may be the odd statement that is cute. Let's get past it with no problems. Uh, I will use several videos that are from research organizations that will add credibility to you about what I'm about to say because it's quite revolutionary. So I want you to believe this, that it's not just me inventing stuff. And also we have time constraints, so that'll help you. And I hope at the end of this, you will at least ask one question. That's all I ask. Just one question, right? Uh, the presentation is in two parts. The first part, I'm going to do perils and pitfalls. Why you get into trouble. And then I'll show you how to do defensible remedies. The reason I have to do this is because it's like walking. You've been doing this all your life. If somebody asks you to change the manner in which you walk, it's very difficult. It's the same with decision making. You've been doing this all the time, and I have to do something to unlearn you first, right? So how many of you would give your car to a mechanic who is not trained? Anyone? No. Would you go to a dentist who is not trained? Certainly not, right? Come on, that's what if you like, but, but why not? The reason is you know that he'll mess up your car and your mouth. And also, you know that somebody who is trained would do a better job. Agreed? Yeah. All right. Then what about untrained decision makers? Hmm? Is that reality true? I mean, you, you believe. Is it not likely that they might make some little quirky thing about it? So let me start with a video about judgment and experience and all of those. Hard to hear? I suppose it's a little hard to hear. Let me see if I can get the volume up here. No, it's at full. Maybe there is no sound connection to the to this cord. Let's play this and I'll try to help you through. Most of his type, so you can see. Where's the mic? I can hold it here. Oh, it's so that's the first thing I want to show you. That companies such as Kodak, TWA, Microsoft, Blockbuster, Yahoo, all these guys with expert decision makers, employed strategic planners, you name it. How the hell did they make a mess of this thing? Because they, this illusion is there that we know how to make decisions, right? So is it not possible that in your personal life also, that you're going to make some very bad calls and it's going to hurt you deeply? What we're going to talk today is about four basic, I mean, first let me explain four types and then say what we're going to talk about. The first type is what I call strategic decisions. This cannot be modeled easily. This is like, should the US invade Venezuela? Or should we think of North Korea being a nuclear power? That kind of stuff you can't model. They're strategic. There's operational decisions that you do every day. The decision to come here, go home, drive your car. All of that is just operational. You just do it. Then there are reactions. Quarterbacks, they throw the ball, it's almost a reaction. Firefighters jump in and jump out. But the important thing is about resource investments, ladies and gentlemen. This is investing time, money, energy, 
all of that. These are the ones that we need to try to actually model, right? Now, of course, in the world of big data, there are three broad categories of data-driven decisions. One, the first one is decisions made by systems to operate systems. Your dishwasher, your washing machine, even Tesla and all of these cars. This is a system that operates other systems. Then there are systems, decisions made by systems to serve humans, which is the most difficult one. And then there are decisions that we humans make with feelings to serve other humans or systems or operations. So we're going to talk about I type 3 so that you understand where we are coming from. So how many of you have solved a problem? Right. So let's understand first what is problem solving. Imagine you have a son or a grandson who has a problem with his foot when he runs, it swells up. That's a symptom. So you go to the doctor and he looks at the problem and says, ah, now I know what the problem is. He's got a deformed arch that we need to fix. So you ask him, what shall I do? So he says, well, there are several options. You know, we can put it on ice, bandage it, wear a special shoe or even surgical intervention. Now he gave you some solutions. Somebody has to make a decision on which one. You can't do all of this. And then we have to do what is called decision validation. And I'll explain that in a minute. And finally, you have to implement it. So there are six steps to problem solving. It's not just grab a problem and solve the problem. We're going to talk only about steps four and five. I'm not involved in the rest of the picture because problem solving is not decision making. Problem solving is unique to the domain expert, the guy. Bankers know how to solve their problems. IT guys know their, how to solve their problems. Right? Hoteliers know their problems. I don't know how to go and solve their problems. But decision making is unique to the person. Right? So to explain this better, imagine touch wood, nothing happens. But this evening when you go home on your way, the red light on your car, in your car comes up saying service engine. Oops. So you go to Jim, your mechanic, and say, hey, Jim, what's the problem? He says, let's run the diagnostics. Then he comes and says, hey, Joe, you got a gear train problem. So your first question is, Jim, what shall I do? He says, I can repair it, but I can't promise the shelf life. We can replace with a reef, go to insure it. Or we can install a brand new unit, you know, if you have some So now we are quite happy, and as you think around it, Jim comes back and says, hey, Joe, uh, your car's knocking a few years. You ought to se consider selling the car. Now, what did Jim do? Jim solved your problem. But who makes the decision? Not Jim, you. You have to make the decision president of a company or an organization or a nation does not solve problems, ladies and gentlemen. He or she makes decisions. So I hope you understand the difference between decision making and problem solving. Sadly, if you Google, it always comes up as if the two are together, right? So let's first try to purchase a laptop that most of you have purchased. We start with some criteria. So what's the screen size or the RAM or the hard drive or anything you like? Then we find some computers in the marketplace that we have, right? Then finally, we get all the data. We have the prices, then we have all this crap. Now what do you do? You sit and watch and watch and glaze and glare, wondering, what should I do? I mean, you have all this data. Common sense, gut feel, whatever you want to do. There are people who make decisions in many ways. Some of us pray for divine intervention. I mean, that's true. Others go to fortune tellers. I mean, we might laugh, but Nancy Reagan was well known for having a fortune teller. Some use dictatorial methods. Hey, I'll decide what to do. Others decide by teams and consensus. Some, like judges and police and all of these people, they have to follow established rules. Some, like statisticians and the weatherman, they use pattern recognition. Some of us even think of tradition and superstition. I mean, if you don't think so, there's no 13th floor in a building. No, on a plane, there's no row 13. Well, are they still thinking of superstition? Of course they are. What about gambling, luck, gut feel, logic, experience? If it all fails, you post one and hope it'll go away. Otherwise, you delegate to somebody else. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk to you about analytical decision making. 
something beyond this, all this stuff that I spoke of. First, let's try our common sense. How many of you think you have good common sense? Hands up. Some are even shy. Right. Come on. Okay. Watch this video and let's test our common sense. So Roger, who is married, is looking at Mary. Mary is looking at David, who is unmarried. So the question is, is a married person looking at an unmarried person? Your answer should be A, B, or C. Come on, tell me. Anybody else? You can't sit on the fence, A, B, or C. Okay, let's see what it is, right? What would you like to know? You said you want more information. What do you want to know? Age, country, culture, whatever. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Whether Mary is married or? Okay, let's test it out. If Mary is married, married Mary is looking at unmarried. So the answer is yes. And if Mary is unmarried, married Roger is looking at unmarried Mary. It's still yes. So did we need more information? Yes or no? We did not. Under both scenarios, a married person is looking at an unmarried person. But our common sense said, no, 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 you need more information. Why? Because this is the limitation of common sense. Let me try a different one. We live in a world of uncertainty. The reason we have to make decisions is because we are in an uncertain domain. So, let's have a lady called Linda. She's 34 years old, bright, outspoken. She graduated in music and philosophy. Even as a student, she was convinced that youth engaged in music and art were not prone to drugs or gang activities. So she, she understands the value of music. Now, if we want to know what is Linda most likely to be between these two, could she be a bank teller? Most likely, I meant. Or bank teller and part-time music teacher? A or B? B. That's what we would all like to think, right? But we failed again. It's actually A. Now, why did I say A? Not because I'm guessing. I'm going to prove it to you that it's A. Let's take this class right here. The number of males in this class, maybe 12, maybe, right? That's condition one. That is your male. Born in this city will always be greater because this is to satisfy two conditions. So if I had 12 males, all 12 are not born in this city. Could be 11 even. But he never be greater than. Correct? So satisfying one condition is always greater than satisfying two conditions. So Linda being a bank teller, which is satisfying one condition, will always be greater than her being a bank teller. So you see what happens in a world of uncertainty. We are failing with our decisions. Something is so simple. A common sense lets you down. I'm going to give you one last one. <clears throat> it's called the game show. Very interesting little problem. Again, about uncertainty, right? Imagine you're on a game show. Can you hear? The game show host shows you three doors. Behind one of the doors is a star prize, a car. Behind the other two doors are two booby prizes. Two goats. Two goats. So now, so what do you have? You have three doors. Behind one, there's a car. There are two goats behind the other. You don't know which one. Now I'm going to ask you to pick one. You have no way of knowing which door conceals which item. Whichever door you pick, you'll receive the price behind it. You're asked to pick a door. But before it is open, the game show host opens one of the other two doors. Now the host knows where the car is. And he always opens a door to reveal a goat. So, oops, sorry. Oh dear. Hang on. It is open. The game show host. So, what I'm trying to tell you is this there are three doors, two goats, and one car. And I told you, pick one. Now, you picked one. We can't see. You can't see, but I know what it is. I will always show you uh, the other two, one goat. Now the question is, opens one of the other two doors. 
Now the host knows where the car is and he always opens a door to reveal a goat. You're then asked whether you'd like to swap your chosen door for the one remaining door. The question is, should you swap or should you stick with your original choice? Which would give you the greatest chance of winning the car? So that's the question. Would you stick to what you picked or would you swap? Huh? You will stick, right? Again, we're wrong. Why? That's the problem about uncertainties. So I'm going to explain to you now why you should swap. So here is the explanation. So you pick a door. What are the possibilities? You could have a goat or a car. Since the host knows where the car and the goats are, he opens a door always to show you a goat. If in the first instance you pick a goat and he shows you a goat, you know that by swapping you would get the car. Now if you had picked the car and the host shows a goat, you know you need to stick with the original selection. Now, if you know which one you picked, it's very easy. If it turned out to be a goat, you would swap. If it turned out to be a car, you would stick. But of course you don't know that. But there is a 67% probability that you would pick a goat and only a 33% probability that you would pick a car. Therefore, because the probability of picking a goat the first time is twice as likely, you should always swap. That's the reason. You see, you don't know which one, but the likelihood of your first pick is a goat. I mean, there are two goats and a one. So because the likelihood of picking a goat is higher, you must always say, it's got to be a swap. If not, I will explain later. So this is the kind of thing that uncertainty has created to us. And you will just live with common sense and you hope, oh, I think I can manage this, you know, I know it. And many, many top managers go about it. So we failed, unfortunately, not 100%, but didn't do too well. Now let's take in the real world what happens. So you're all startup guys, you all have businesses. Imagine you just got a contract to sub supply some minerals to Intel Corp. Unfortunately, you can get it only from Angola, Congo, and Liberia, three countries in West Africa. This particular mineral only comes. And just like De Beers mines, they control the price. So availability, price, air freight are all equal. Only thing you have to buy from only one place because of price volume discount. You call up the embassy and the CIA and they say, watch out, there are political instabilities. These countries are a disaster. But you have no choice. Where would you buy it from then? Come on. Participate, please. Don't feel bad. There's no right and wrong answer. Remember, as I said, all conditions are equal. So it doesn't really matter. Availability, price, logistic, everything is the same. It does not matter, right? But question is, what, would you like more information? What would you like to know? Okay, that's called the likelihood of this event happening. It's called event probability. So I'm going to tell you, there's a 25% chance of riots in Congo, 30% chance of a coup in Angola, and a 35% chance of a new government in Liberia. Can you now decide where to go from? Yeah. Very good, my friend. What about the impact? Thank you, sir, Sergei. Unless you know the impact, it has no value, right? Because, okay, something's happening. Now, if you just told me now that in Palo Alto, there has been a shooting or something, all highways are closed. But if you're living in San Jose, who cares? There's no impact on you. The event happened, but there's no impact. So I'm going to give you the impact. Now, Congo, 5% probability was there, but the impact is 20% probability nothing is going to happen to us. 50% probability, we lose 30%. And 30% probability, we lose only 40%. So now we understand its impact. So again, is that correct? Yeah. I'll give you data for the others. Ladies and gentlemen, now you have 21 data points. Can you make a common sense decision? 
And you say, oops, too much information. <laughs> I don't want to know about this stuff. Are you going to tell your boss, well, I couldn't decide because I had too much information? No, you can't do that. What about multiplication of the spectrum? And, uh, what about multiplication of the spectrum? There is a technique, but there is a little more complex than that. that. That's one of the methods we use. Uh, it's not straightforward. And, and let me explain this much better. So we have event probability, which is EP, and impact probability, which is IP. The best way to explain is between a vehicle accident and a plane crash. Touch something happens, but on the way home today, you're on your way home, there's a 10% chance that somebody will come and hit you from behind. I mean, I don't know the number, but you just said. And there's a 50% chance your car will be severely damaged. And there's a 20% chance you will also get injured. Some numbers. Is that fair? Now, with a plane crash, it's quite different. The event probability is 0 0.00001. I mean, there's a very small probability of a plane crashing. But guess what? The impact probability is pretty nasty. So, ladies and gentlemen, first thing you're learning today is because we live in a world of uncertainty, probability is part of your integrated life. And when you deal with probability, you must think of event probability and you must think of impact probability. Now, let's take a case of a multi criteria decision. This is something that you do all the time. Imagine you just want a green card lottery to come to the USA or your friend or your brother and you're planning to move now and you have to decide where to live. So you ask for my help and say, hey doc, can you help us find a place to live? And I say, sure, no problem. So I said, what would you like? Do you like hot places or cold places? Are you concerned about home prices, taxes? Well, you have in concerns with doctors, officers, maybe hospitals. Are you concerned about pollution? Are you concerned about crime? Would you like to live close to family? Are these fair questions? Everybody. Right. So now I put down a set of criteria. And now I go on the internet, and this is real data, by the way. I pick up all the data for these cities. These are real cities, by the way, since I normally change the number. This is Atlanta, Raleigh, Phoenix, Jacksonville, Seattle, Orlando, and El Paso. They're real. I've just changed the name so that people don't get carried away. Now, can you make a decision on where you want to live? Oops, too much information. Don't give me this stuff. Once again, you're struggling. And you'll try to assign some weights or something here and multiply the weights and the points. That people use, and I used to use it years back. I've developed a much totally different methodology. We'll come to that in a minute. Now, this could be the same as selecting a supplier in your startups. You may have to select suppliers. You may have to hire. You may have to open a branch office. Even procurement stuff you do. You are facing this problem every day, ladies and gentlemen. And you're relying on common sense. And I just proved to you with two or three simple problems how feeble this common sense is. Now, if you think you're in total control of your decisions, and some of us like to think so, right? I'm going to now show you who you're not. Because some people impose constraints on what options are available to you. Others modify the environment to shape your decisions. And some manipulate your thought process, and you don't even know it. And I'll show it to you now in a sensible way. Watch this incredible study that has been done. Yes. Free suasion. Free suasion is the practice of getting people sympathetic to your message before they experience it. It is what you say immediately before you deliver your message that leverages your success tremendously. Told people, I left something in the car. Can I get your key to let myself back in? I have a, an acquaintance who claims he got three great jobs by saying something before he began the job interview in each instance. And persuasion demonstrably works by prepping the mind for the message subliminally. There's this interesting study, a guy goes to a shopping mall in France and he tries to get women's phone numbers as they pass various shops so he could call for a date. One of them is a shoe store and another was a bakery. But in neither of those cases was he very successful. So just to give you an idea, this woman in Paris, the study, study was done, she, he would go to this good-looking guy he would go to the mall, stand in front of a shoe shop, 
and later on in front of a bakery, and he's asking young girls, hey, would you like to give your phone number for a date? His success rate was only 13%. Now see, see what, what happens, happens when he stands in front of a You only got a number of 13% shop. of the time. But there was one kind of shop that doubled his success rate when women were passing it, a flower shop. Why? Because flowers put women in the mindset of Rome. So you see, why, when he was standing in front of a shoe store and a bakery, his success rate was 13%. But when he stood in front of a flower shop, he had doubled the rate of success. Why? Women never realized that they were actually there. But the mindset changed, right? This is the incredible thing of subliminal persuasion. Consciously, persuasively, by exploiting a rule of thumb passed down to us, but if we are paying attention to something, it's important. That's how we decide to pay attention. But a communicator can rewrite our attention to something that isn't important, but make it seem important as a consequence as a consequence of the very fact that we're subconsciously paying attention to it. There's a study that shows that people who were asked their political opinions when there was a picture of the American flag in the core of the uh, questionnaire reported more favorable attitudes toward Republican Party positions. It's amazing. The, the questionnaire, when it had the American flag on the side, the response was more Republican oriented. When the flag was missing, people were not as partial to Republican because the flag represented the Republic. It's, a, it's an incredible thing that happens to your mind and you don't even know it. Associated in people's minds with a Republican belief set. Now marketers, or at least some of them, have studied persuasion's potency. Quick, how many of you have a website or is in the process of developing a website? Watch this. This is very important, okay? One online furniture store tested images of fluffy clouds versus cold hard cash on its homepage. Those who saw the background depiction of clouds searched the site for more comfortable furniture. Those who went to the site that had money in the background became cost kind. It's incredible. The same website, when they showed clouds in the background, the customers, the clients went and searched for more comfortable furniture. And when they had coins in the background, they were cost conscious and none of them knew that the, what the background was when they were asked. And preferred to purchase less expensive furniture. Almost no one recognizes that the clouds or the coins had any impact on their behavior. And yet it did. And the point I'm trying to make to you is this. When you, when you want to do a website, what do you do? You find some fancy looking website similar to what you like. You hire a developer and you tell him to develop a website. He has no clue about this stuff that's going on behind the scene. And the impact of that in your business is huge, right? So the question is, do you really believe persuasion works? I bet your bottom dollar it works, right? Now, what about, this is incredible. So you've got to pay attention. This is now mind manipulation. Watch this. Professor John Bard shocked and outraged his fellow. It's called Prime. If you're watching uh, television or watching a movie or reading a book, and what's happening in the movie or TV uh, could be something. And you might be more likely to see another person as a brave person or another person as a kind person or an intelligent person more than usual and more than you would have had the prior event not happened and that's the nature of priming but what is more worrying is how those thoughts and feelings can then change our behavior what we do in our experiment we very briefly expose people to a warm or cold substance and what we expect to happen is that that simple experience with a warm substance or a cold substance will prime people to sort of activate these uh, feelings of warmth and comfort and the things that we've learned about since we were very young. Volunteers for the experiment are asked to hold a warm cup of coffee as they are met by Lawrence. They have been primed with heat. The purpose of the experiment is to record participants' judgments about Lawrence's colleague, Randy. 
was great. It was awesome. Well, it was good until I got stranded in Florida what because happened? of the snowstorm oh. in New York on Friday. So I got stranded. Cut. And here's the killer question. Would you give Randy a permanent job? Based on your brief interaction with Randy, or would you hire him um, as project manager? Uh, he seemed like a, a generally friendly guy. So yeah, I would say so. Yeah, why not? <laughs> sure. Yes. 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 Saying warm and friendly things about a stranger might just be the normal polite response. Time to cool things down. <laughs> Except for the temperature of the drink. Identical conditions. The same conversation with Randy. How was your break? You glad to be there? Not really. <laughs> and six minutes later, the same questions from Lawrence. Based on your brief interaction with him, would you recommend him or would you hire Randy as project manager? Uh, as a leader? I'm not sure. Based on the brief interaction? No. Maybe not from the impression that I got. The experiment shows, remarkably, that a brief encounter with a beverage could see you either hired or fired. It's a powerful effect, and one that might have worrying applications. In the case of, say, uh, consumer products, um, feeling warm about a product presumably will make you more likely to buy it. Um, feeling warm about a spokesperson may make you be more likely to listen to that person and trust their judgment. So this is the incredible thing that just touching something warm. So what did we learn from here? Interesting thing. At a business meeting, serve hot drinks instead of something cold. But if you're on a date, order a hot soup instead of a salad because your things can be manipulated and you don't know what goes on, right? Now, the last video that I want to show you is about, this is incredible. It's about your famous thing called logic and intuition, where you think your logic is going to help you through. I'm, I'm trying to give you some insight into this. Daniel Kahneman received the Nobel Prize for his work in the area of behavioral economics. Here he speaks of the two systems that we humans rely on to make decisions. At the heart of human thinking, there's a conflict between logic and intuition that leads to mistakes. No, I mean, we need to wait and operate What is the fast thing? An automatic effortless mode, and that's the one we're in most of the time. You're there, the only thing that you see and that you understand, you know, this is a tree, that's a helicopter, that's the Statue of Liberty. Visual perception, all of this comes through system one. The other mode is slow, deliberate, logical, and rational. This is system two. This is the best example of the two systems. There's really two plus two is on one side, and 17.24 is on the other. What is two plus two? Four. And what's two plus two? So you can see, if I ask you what is two plus two, you don't think, you just say four. But now what happens if I give you a tougher problem? You have to pause and think. So what happens? What? It is automatic. It just happens to you. It's almost like a reflex. And what's the 22 times 17? But when we have to pay attention to a tricky problem, we engage slow but logical system two. If you can do that in your head, you'll have to follow some rules and to do it sequentially. And that is not automatic at all. That involves work, it involves concentration. And can I get you to just walk with me uh, for a second? System two may be clever, but it's also slow, limited, and lazy. If you are expected to do something that demands a lot of effort, you will stop even walking. Mm -hmm. 51. Uh, 16. This question concerns this nice bottle of champagne I have here. Uh, another thing to guys buy to give you a generally nice vintage bottle. Um, these people think they're about to use slow, sensible system two to make a Now they're going to be asked how much they'll pay for this bottle of champagne. Watch carefully what happens rational decision about how much they would pay for a bottle of champagne. But what they don't know is that their decision will actually be taken totally without their knowledge by their hidden fast autopilot, System 1. And with the help of a bag of ping pong balls, we can influence that decision. 
set of random balls here from 1 to 100 in this bag. I'd like to reach in and draw one out at random for me, if you would. First, they've got to choose a ball. Number says 10. 10. 10. 10. But it's rigged. They think it's a random number, but in fact it's rigged. All the balls are marked with the low number 10. What we do is purposefully, we give people a tough decision that is clearly meaningless. 10. 10. Okay. Would you be willing to play 10 pounds for this nice bottle of vintage champagne? I would, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. This first decision is meaningless, based as it is on a seemingly random number. But what it does do is lodge the low number 10 in their heads. Now for the real question, where we ask them how much they actually pay for the champagne. What's the maximum amount you think you'd be willing to pay? 20? Okay. Seven pounds. Seven pounds. Okay. Probably ten pounds. A range of fairly low offers. But what happens if we prime people with a much higher number? Sixty-five instead of ten. What does that one say? Sixty-five. Okay. It says sixty-five. How will this affect the price people are prepared to pay? What's the maximum you would be willing to pay for this bottle of champagne? Forty? Forty-five pounds. Forty-five. Okay. Fifty. Much higher. Logic has gone out the window. The price people are prepared to pay is influenced by nothing more than a number written on a ping pong ball. Just see what happens to our decision making. I mean, people's price willing to pay was influenced by nothing more than a number on a ping pong ball. And this pervades your other fields, ladies and gentlemen. You are making decisions, corporate decisions, startup decisions, procurement decisions, hiring decisions, all of those. And you keep thinking you're using system two, but you gravitate to system one. And I'm going to prove this to you. Let me ask a simple question and please participate. If you buy a laptop for $800 and sell it for $1,000, what is the profit, everybody? Huh? $200. Very simple, right? Okay. A slightly more complicated thing. A bat cost a dollar more than a ball. And a bat and a ball together cost a dollar ten. How much does the ball cost? That's what you'd think, right? Not true. A ball costs five cents. What happened to you, ladies and gentlemen, after I even told you about gravitating from system two to system one, you fell for it again. You just used your common sense at 10 cents. But it required you to think through it. But we fail it every time. That's why I spent the last 20 years working on decision making because I'm amazed how we make a mess of this thing continuously. Now, a thing that is probably, anybody sell products in your businesses? Your business is not taken off and sell products, yeah? If you're selling products, pay attention to this because McDonald's uses this as well. So does Walmart. This technique is called and ghost options. The use of ghost options to influence your decision. I'll give you a couple of more examples of irrational decision making. Imagine I give you a choice. Do you want to go for a weekend to Rome? All expenses paid, hotel, transportation, food, breakfast, the continental breakfast, everything, or a weekend in Paris. Now, weekend in Paris, weekend in Rome, these are different things. They have different food, different culture, different art. Now imagine I added a choice to the set, imagine I said a weekend in Rome, a weekend in Paris, what if it was a trip to Rome, all expenses paid, transportation, breakfast, but doesn't include coffee in the morning. If you want coffee, you have to pay for it yourself, it's two euros fifty. Now, in some ways, given that you can have Rome with coffee, why would you possibly want Rome without coffee? It's an inferior option. But guess what happened? The moment you add Rome without coffee, Rome with coffee become more popular and people cheap. The fact that you have Rome without coffee makes Rome with coffee look superior and not just to Rome without coffee, even superior to Paris. <clears throat> Here are two examples of this principle. Now watch this. This was an ad from The Economist a few years ago that gave us three choices. An online subscription for $59, a print subscription for $125, or you can get both for $125. So which one would you like if you had the money? Anybody take B? Yes? Why not? 
Why wouldn't you take B? Come on. A is just the digital version. B is the print version. C is the print and digital version. Would you take B? No. No. Why? Because you can take the C and get both, same price, right? Now watch what happens here. I took this and I gave it to 100 MIT students. This was done under the MIT choose. actually. And these are the market share. Most people wanted the combo deal. Thankfully, nobody wanted the dominated option. But now, if you have an option. So there, B was not required. Agreed? Now, what happens if you take B out? Option that nobody wants, you would take it off. Right? So I, took, I printed another version of this when I eliminated the middle option. And I gave it to another 100 students. Here's what happens. Uh, now the most popular option became the least popular and the least popular. How do you like that? As soon as you removed B, the taste, the choice changed. Here is something that nobody wanted, sitting there doing nothing. There's an explanation. Okay. The most popular. What was happening is that option that was useless in the middle was useless in the sense that nobody wanted it. But it wasn't useless in the sense that it helped people figure out what they wanted. In fact, relative to the option in the middle, which was only the print 425, the print and web 425 looked like a fantastic deal. And as a consequence, people changed. The general idea here, by the way, is that we actually don't know our preferences. That's an important statement. We really don't know our preferences that well. So we are susceptible to all these external influences. We like to think we know what we want. And because we don't know our preferences that well, we're susceptible to all of these influences from the external forces. One more example of this. Uh, people believe that when we deal with physical attraction, we see somebody and we know immediately whether we like them or not, attractive or not. This is why we have these four-minute dates. Um, so I decided to do this experiment with people. I'll show you graphic images of people, not real people. The experiment was with people. I showed some people a picture of Tom, a picture of Jerry, and I said, who do you want to date, Tom or Jerry? But for half the people, I added an ugly version of Jerry. I took Photoshop and I made Jerry slightly less attractive. The other people, I added an ugly version of Tom. And the question was, will ugly Jerry and ugly Tom help more attractive brothers? And the answer was absolutely yes. When Ugly Jerry was around, Jerry was popular. When Ugly Tom was around, Tom was popular. <laughs> this, of course, has two very clear implications for, for life in general. Um, if you ever go bar hopping, who do you want to take with you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you want a slightly uglier version of yourself. Similar, similar, but slightly uglier. And, and the second point, of course, is that uh, if somebody else invites you, you know how they think about you. So if you get invited next time to go bar hopping, you know what they think of you, right? But the point is, what is McDonald's doing with this information? This is actually the menu of McDonald's fries. I took it out and I'll show it to you in enlarged form. Small fries, for $1.39 you get 74 grams, $1.79, etc. But what is interesting is if you divide that number by two, 37 grams of fries cost you 70 cents. But here's the kicker. When you move from the medium to the large, you get 35 grams for just 10 cents, ladies and gentlemen. McDonald's has placed that medium, which is their ghost option. They know very well you're not going to buy it. But it's put there to take you to the big one. So the ghost option is used by many, many marketers. Everywhere, your cell phone plans, your internet service provider, they all use it. Your bank offering you CDs, stock options, all of those, they'll give you an, a number that is inserted there as a ghost option just to drive you to the next level. So hopefully you're convinced that in the world of big data, you could be in trouble, right? Now, I'm going into showing you to remind you, don't let your feelings hijack your behavior. So I want to move up a little faster here. And I'll get to the fundamentals. Okay, so decision making is part art and part science. 
We start with some objective. I want to change my job. I want to start up a company. I want to get married. I want to, whatever, whatever that job objective is, doesn't matter to me. So you have certain options and you find, somehow you make a decision. Whatever technique, doesn't matter to me. In future, ladies and gentlemen, don't make a decision without criteria. Rule number one, criteria are the factors that drive your decision. And of course, now we have C and C, our criteria and our candidates. So we need a process to make that decision, right? When we search for the optimum decisions, there are two important things. First is how to reach your quality decision. These are the five traits, data and information, context information, creative options, solution techniques, and whether the decision maker is trained and expert. However, the implementation depends on appropriate timing, resources, and changing circumstances under which we don't have any control. So ladies and gentlemen, the outcome is the sum total of these two. And that's what I say something that you may not agree with. Do not judge the quality of a decision by the outcome. But 99% of the people fall for this. As a decision maker, you have to also manage to negotiate. That's why I teach negotiating as well. Because he has to deal with problem solvers, information providers, the implementers, the people impacted. And of course, my bad manager, he's got the budget and the authority and the desire to have this thing done, right? We have developed a seven step process for multi-criteria decisions. And you have to follow these seven steps, step by, by the way, I do have some books here. Later on, I'll give it to you if you want to. Clearly define your objective, identify relevant criteria, conduct a criteria segregation, identify candidates, gather information, put out a judgment table, assign ways to obligatory criteria and rank your candidates. These are the seven steps. Now you'll see the letters AHP next to steps three, six, and seven. And if you Google AHP, you will see that the last conference had 90 papers published by 19 countries. It's something well established, well known. And it's been used for a ton of stuff, including the 2005 military base closures by the US Department of uh, Defense Department. So I'm going to explain this in a video, how the process so works. Let me explain the AHP technique. All decisions are based upon some form of comparison. We cannot look at this picture and say, this person is tall or short. But when we compare him to another person, we see that he is short. As you can see, all decisions are relative, not absolute. Imagine you're at an airport and you're watching the TV screen and two pictures are presented. And you've asked to distribute 100 points among these ladies, 60, 40. 30, 70, whatever it is. Difficult? Probably not. Now we're shown four pictures and again asked to distribute 100 points. Difficult? Probably a bit more. This time, seven pictures are presented. This time, it requires much more effort. You're probably ready to give up. Let's get back to the pair. Would you say that the pair was easiest to handle? Mm. Obviously. Would you also agree that as the number of contestants increased, it became increasingly more difficult to make a reliable judgment? Let's take a look at a problem in the real world. Your manager wants to promote you, but wants you to find a replacement. So you start with a set of criteria. Here we have 37 criteria, and you are asked to select those that are applicable to your particular job. You might select 10, 15, whatever the number is. Now imagine seven candidates are presented as now, in the previous example where I presented pictures of seven ladies, I only showed you the face. I did not show the body, the walk, the talk, the swimsuits, nothing. And even when you dealt with one single criterion, that of facial beauty, you had difficulty deciding between the seven ladies. How do you think you would handle 10 or 15 criteria? Almost impossible. Additionally, there are multiple decision makers. How would you make a defensible decision? This is a 3D problem with multiple criteria, multiple candidates, and multiple decision makers. Most certainly beyond common sense decision making. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have been told my time is up, so I've got to bring it to an end. I have a little more, another 15, 20 minutes, but that's okay. So what you heard was basically the perils and faults of decision making. So hopefully it's a wake up call for you to take serious note of what you're doing and how things could go wrong. We have developed methodologies to, to overcome it. That's the remedy side, okay? Any questions, I'm open to whatever you want to ask. Here for Dr. Earl.
Thank you, sir. So uh, we'd like to take as many questions as possible. Uh, who's got a question for Dr. Earl? All right. Sure. Go for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much for your presentation. It was very knowledgeable. And um, just uh, the question about um, this heat and cold stuff. So I know that's when even you handshake, if yeah. your hand is cold, probability that uh, it has an influence, yeah. yeah. It will influence the same with the heart. But how about um, to invite some, uh, let's say, investor to your office and make the, the warm room? It will affect, do you think, or? Uh, I think the it's. Wor warm or uh, like. Uh, the counter side, if they're not accustomed to warm temperature, they may want to leave faster than they are seated. So you want to keep. hot, but I mean, yeah. warmer. No, but I think what you give is more important than where they are. They have to be comfortable, but what these people found was, at Yale, was by the touch that they felt this. Gotcha. But the touch was the one that was. Anybody else, please ask any question you want. I'll hold that for you, anybody. Not much question, okay, so Atul. Thank you, Dr. L. wonderful presentation. Thank you Thanks. for coming here. And thank you, Rob, for uh, bringing such wonderful speakers to, uh, to, uh, to our sessions. Um, the, when we talk about decisions, there's no guarantee. You can make the best process, but there's still no guarantee that your decision will be successful. It goes back to your point about we should not judge the decision by the outcome. The quality of the decision by the outcome. Right. Not the, so much as... Don't judge the quality of the decision because everything I spoke was how to make a high quality decision. I didn't talk about implementation. As you correctly point out, the outcome is a function of the quality of the decision and the implementation. So you can have a top notch decision badly implemented and then you say, what happened? Right. So you're right. The implementation could suffer. I mean, the outcome could suffer because of the implementation. Yeah, that's my point. So, okay. We see a lot of startups here that uh, don't work out. They fail with yeah. best uh, decision techniques and everything. And, and uh, now they're using AI tools and everything else. But still, that's uh, a lot of uh, There's a lot problems. of other factors play at play. Sergey, did you have a question? Uh, yes, doctor. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, my question is, uh, for example, tomorrow I'm going to have a meeting. And uh, during that meeting, I will have to make a decision get information and make a decision. How should I prepare myself by tomorrow to be in a good shape physically, psychologically, mentally, to make a good decision on this meeting in, in general? Okay. Thank you. Well, there are two parts to it, actually. Uh, first, I always say, if the consequences, and follow my words carefully, if the consequences of a bad decision is not serious, it doesn't matter. Should I have coffee or tea? It doesn't matter. There are no serious consequences. If the consequences are serious, you should not make a decision. You should buy more time. So this brings to the other part of my training. I do two trainings. Uh, two, my specialty is in two areas, decision making and negotiating. That's why I said every action is a decision. Every interaction is a negotiation. What you're talking actually is bringing out your negotiating skills to buy the time that you need to thwart the decision and not make it on the spot, because the consequences are too serious. Yeah, sorry, please. Yeah, OK. Yes, go for it. So like the probability of making decision, we need to include uh, the probability, or we need to go with our gut feeling. Or even there is a lot of environmental factors, like hot coffee, or uh, in, the, in the front of any flower shop, or there are a lot of environmental okay. things are there. So even that also will be a influence the probability of outcome. Sure. So we need to go with probability or our gut feeling? We have to, whenever possible. I'll tell you, there, there's several factors that play into it. One of the, and I want to make a phrase that I want you to understand carefully as I say it. What happens with logic, intuition, gut feel, experience, decision, is what we call decision contamination, as opposed to criteria contamination. So what I do is, in my specialty work, I own three software products also for this kind of work. We break down the decision into its minor components. 
and we allow you to contaminate it at individual levels, but it doesn't contaminate the major decision. It's like you looking at a young girl and saying, oh, I love her, let me go out a couple of dates, we get married, or whatever it is. That's what I call a decision contamination. It happens so far at the top. But if you had like match.com or something where you put all your criteria and you say, well, these don't match, this quality doesn't match, you have made some mistakes at lower level. It's okay. So the advantage of analytical decision making is, especially in the world of big data and VUCA, this is what's happening. In the olden days, it was easier because we didn't have so much data to bother us. If you think of your generation, the seniors like myself here, if you saw a retail store in the 1950s, they didn't have supply chain or anything. The guy went to the wholesale market, bought some stuff in a bicycle, came back, put it there and sold it, went back tomorrow and bought it. But today, when they sell a pencil at a Walmart cashier, the China's factory is also saying EOQ has to start producing. What we have come into is the huge data manipulation. The trouble with AI stuff is, until as, up to now is, it has re removed the feelings component out of it. And I have a famous question I always ask people. I own a Tesla myself and I always say, imagine I'm driving my car on a mountainous road. One side is the mountain, the other side is the precipice. There's a truck behind me trying to overtake me. My mother and my daughter are sitting in the back. There's an old lady with a baby seated on the side. And suddenly the baby jumps out to pick a ball. I have the following options. Turn right, kill the mother, the old lady. Go straight, kill the baby. Cut left, go down the precipice. Slam the brakes, hit from behind. No machine can decide that for you. It's a context of what? Did you lose a child before, six months before? Or have you had an accident before that, just coming here? Context has a lot to do with it. Feelings has a lot to do with it. You're going to make each decision. So AI has still not reached the level where they can take our context in. It will come, the day will come. But right now, feelings are an integral part of uh, human decision making. So the word intelligence has danger because it doesn't incorporate feelings. That's the catch. Please. Um, to properly make a decision, one of the important factors is emotions. So, I mean, uh, whenever you're just discussing something, etc., it's sometimes too hard to avoid the emotions. And uh, what kind of methods or okay. tactics perfect, you can use? Yeah. Perfect question. That's exactly what I was saying. What we do is we break down the problem to its criteria level and let your emotions get into those. So some will be right, some will be wrong. But it doesn't contaminate the full decision. When it, our software brings it up to the top, you say, you didn't pick the girl by looking at the picture. You looked at the data. So I understand inevitably our emotions will fail us in some way. No question. But it doesn't fail you wholesale when things really are bad because you have broken down so remember the term decision contamination versus criteria contamination contamination exists without a doubt you can't avoid it that's what we are referring to our emotions will contaminate our decisions but i'd rather keep it at a lower level and not at the top so one of the rules i tell the younger people at high schools when i, I always say anytime i reply to some of you never go to a store and buy something that you did not go to buy. Repeat that statement. You only buy what you went to buy. I ran two liquor stores of my own. I'm kind of a crazy guy. And I know all the marketing techniques. We manipulate your thought process like the hot and the cold. So you see stuff and you buy stuff that, so if there's a bargain that you see, come back home and go back the next day, you'll be safe. That means if you really wanted it. Tell it to my wife. Huh? Tell it to my wife. Oh, yeah, I know, although I, I have the same problem. <laughs> so my point is this. We are experts at manipulating the thought process. These guys, just like McDonald's and all of these people, they have spent a four, I train Walmart also. 
They spent a fortune trying to find ways, and there's a lot more to this than that. For example, you must have seen uh, maybe some famous film star comes on a TV screen to advertise a Jaguar or a Porsche or something, young girl, or a well-known John Connery, maybe something. Is it because that person buys this car? No. That's because, I'm digressing a little bit, but I want to encourage you, all video advertisements, all TV commercials follow the four rules. I-E-E-O. Interrupt, engage, educate, and offer. And next time you watch a TV commercial, watch these four. What it does is, because you're cutting onions or chopping onions or something in the kitchen or playing with the kid, this beautiful voice, known person, step curry, or whoever it is, will interrupt your thought process by appearing there. Within 10 seconds, he disappears, and they say, oh, we found this beautiful ceramic knife. Oh, something new, I'm engaged now. Then they educate you why it's so important. All happening in 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And now you're in thrilled by this. And then they say, if you buy it now, you'll get two for the price of one. What are they doing? They're manipulating your thought process. These guys have studied this at depth. I told you, just by putting a Republican flag on the questionnaire, they found everything was Republican. There have been many studies like this. The only difference between myself and everybody else that I know of, and again, I'm not boasting, but I have not yet found in 20 years. You go on YouTube, you'll see several of these videos. Some of these are from the YouTube. They all speak of uh, perils, but they don't talk of remedies. I couldn't show you because we ran out of time. Remedies are the secret. How do you fix it? Okay, we know all these things are happening, but is there a method to overcome it? Yes, there is, a guaranteed method. Thank you for the, yes, sir. Yes, Professor. Yes. Will you comment something about hurt mentality? What mentality? Hurt mentality. I don't know what that is. Hurt. Hurt. hurt mentality. Oh, yes. Yeah, famous thing. I call it blind leading the blind. Okay. Thank you. Thank blind you. leading the blind. Predominantly, what happens is this. We are so susceptible, right? I call it going along to get along. Even at a meeting, if your buddy, your beer buddy comes out with a proposal, you're less likely to challenge him because he's your beer buddy. So, and also they also know the guy with the highest pay grade makes most decisions because that's his right. So we know this problem exists. But one of the reasons I keep telling is this, go back to analytics and follow the analytical process. Nobody can argue against it and there's a step that couldn't, didn't show you, it's in the book, but if you want to read it, it's called decision validation. And I'm going to explain that in one sentence. And please listen carefully. When we make a decision, we start with some assumptions. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Right. Here is decision validation, the right definition. Decision validation is studying the sensitivity of your decision to the assumptions you made. I repeat, decision validation is studying the sensitivity of your decision to those assumptions. So let's say, for example, I'm a 25-year-old kid, let's say, and I, my mother says, I've got four girls for you to get married to. And he says, I've got this dowry, education, da, 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 all of these things. Now, I build my criteria, I run my model, I get a graphic which says, hey, if you're willing to give up on dowry, this girl is the best. If you're willing to give up on income potential, this girl is better. If you're willing to give up on excessive beauty, this girl is better. Now I get to decide. But at least I know the impact of this on those assumptions I made. I started with this assumption. I work with a stockbroker in the same way. What do stockbrokers do? They go in and feed certain criteria into a database. They pull down 20 stocks. After that, they start looking. That's a filtering process. It's not a decision-making process. They just filtered out. Now they sit there and wonder, which one shall we take? We show you with methodology. Whether you're buying a house, buying a car, finding a partner, changing a job, accepting a job offer, 
finding a career or u university for your kids. They all follow the same process. You can use these techniques exactly the same way. I hope you enjoyed it. Hang on. Thank you very much. We still have 10 minutes to Q&A. So I believe when I work with people, the less personal the better. Because the more personal you get, you bring up subjectivity. So that sounds cold and personal, but if, if business is done in a cold and impersonal way, it's more meritocratic, not subjective. So that's my approach. What do you think of that? As long as you have the data to support it, it's perfect. Because that's your nature. You have willingly taken emotions out of the picture. But that's a call you made. But there are not everybody wants to do that. You're perfectly OK. Because remember, a decision, the individual owns it. It's his decision. I can't make a decision for you. I can't make a decision for you. Because your feelings are in it. In fact, in Rob's case, his absence of feelings are in it. Right? He says, I don't want feelings. And that's valid, perfectly valid. Yes, sir. You know, we live in the valley here, right, where we live in the valley, and a lot of the decisions that we make, you know, they, they want to do that fail fast move, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, but it seems to me, on what you said tonight, if you, because everything is somewhat related to inference, or the inferences that we, you know, either forced upon us or we have ourselves, that fail fast mentality leads you to abandon some well, things. continued loop of bad decisions. Yeah. Instead of breaking that chain, you know, you know, going back to that other book that you uh, pointed out, slow versus fast. Yeah. If you're making fast decisions, you're then therefore making a lot of inferential decisions that are gut based and not absolutely fact based. Well, or decision model based. Yeah, I think what happens is most of the time money is the driver, you know, cash flow. So some CFO fellow just looks at the bottom line. He just says, I'm running out of cash. Either inject more money, what, I, what you do with it is okay. So that's the driver, unfortunately, which should not be many times because there's some beautiful ideas that are dying because people have no time to sit back and regurgitate and bring it back. Uh, I've been at this for 20 years now. And uh, did I make a lot of money? No. But I value other things. I value my freedom. And you have, each one has to decide what they want. If, you want. if the person who's a startup guy is seeing his product failing, rather than abandon it, he should be looking in the periphery what else there was that I could do related to it, because there are so many spin-offs from, there was a couple of guys with those big beards that were left here. They were talking about them being in the video business, and then I caught a glimpse of what they were talking, and I said, hey, you know something? You guys have to get into the e-learning space, because you're so close to it, and their light bulbs went. Because now they realize there was potential for them to expand their own work into the e-learning space because they were doing storybook and all of that kind of stuff. So there are spin-off avenues. Rather than just abandon it, you've got to see where else can I apply this technology or the idea. There's many, many things. But don't run away and abandon it. It takes time to. But, but this, I guess, brings me to the other part of the question. So if we're in this fast-failed mode, you know, we're going to fail fast and break things and all that other BS yeah. that gets told, isn't the real issue defining the real uh, problem, you know, the, the hypothesis or the real problem yeah. first. Because I'll give you an example. There was a guy, th this is the classic example. If you go to Park City, Utah, this guy w had a claim in Park City, Utah. He dug and dug and dug, didn't hit anything, gave up. A big company bought it. For sure. They hit the largest gold deposit ever in his thing. So part of it, the problem, I think, is is if you, if you haven't framed the decision or the, the question correctly, then all the rest of the stuff is. Yeah. In fact, so. Does that make sense? Yeah, Charles, I'll tell you. In my, I, I do full day workshops. One of the modules is objectives, setting objectives. It's one of the most difficult ones, by the way. 
setting your objective is more difficult than actually solving the problem, which is exactly what you're saying. Because there are so many peripheral factors that come into your objective. And then there's the short term, medium, and long term object. If you don't set that up, don't run to solve a problem. I mean, just, just pause and ask yourself, why am I even doing it? There are four questions I tell people that they should always ask. If you've not heard it, I will tell you. Why do it? Why, was it, why do it now? Why was it not done before? And the fourth one is, why should I not do it? Now, these four questions, I've, over my 20 years, I've developed this thing of tremendous value. Why do it? Why do it now? Why was it not done before? And why should I not do it? This last question, ladies and gentlemen, you can't answer. Because you're in too much in love with it. You need to find other people who will answer it for you. And I'll give you an example of that. When President Obama had to go after Osama bin Laden, his national security team was split in two. Biden and Kraut said, don't go. Hillary said, go on one side. Obama was caught in the middle. There's a picture of this, actually, that I have in my slides. He didn't try to decide. He took the dockets, found six retired national security advisors who were gardening and fishing and golfing, gave it to them and said, you got 48 hours to tell me why I shouldn't do it. You understand the question. He said, don't tell me what I want to do. I know what to do, but you tell me why I shouldn't do it, because none of these guys can tell me that, because they're too attached to this thing. One of the greatest favors you startup people can do is find a totally dissociated guy and ask the question, why the hell shouldn't I do this? Because it'll save you a nightmare. Because we fall in love with this stuff so much, we don't want to let go. It's like a pretty girl. We justify every damn thing under the sun. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Bridget. Um, so maybe you touched on this a little bit by what you just said. But um, somebody like me who's constantly presenting people with a number of options for them to make a decision on, do you have any tips on how do you best present the data? And it sounds like helping but, them define their objectives. Yeah, but I'll tell you, but. what you're doing is actually you're negotiating, not decision making. Yeah. That's the catch. <laughs> So that's why I teach these two, because they're so closely related. When I have a workshop, give me a card. I will actually okay. tell you to come and listen in. Because this is the catch. You see, the fundamental rule is this. People buy from people they like. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Right. So what is the key? Likeability. Bridget, don't try to sell them this stuff. Establish a relationship. That's, forget all that came for. Let them go away. Don't push sell. Yeah. Two weeks later, touch base. I talk to insurance companies and I say to them, I get their best sales when I say, sell me. And they bombard me with all this data. Find out who the hell I am. Why am I even here? Make me feel like wanted and cared for because I will only buy from a person I like. Establish likability. Don't worry about the rest. It'll all fall into place. You know, I don't know if you guys know, but I was talking to somebody, Atul. In a couple of months, I'll be 75 years old. And I love every minute of what I do. I still deliver eight-hour workshops because it's the passion that drives me. And I'm always looking for somebody to take over from me before I not go too long in the two. If anyone is interested, it's all free. I'll teach you. I'll guide you. Because this work that I have done over 20 years, I don't want to take to the grave. It'll go with me, unfortunately. It, it's a passion. I have three words that govern me. Learn, earn, return. I learned, I earned. Now I come back to return as much as I can. All right. Well, let's give it up for Dr. Earl. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, the video will be on our YouTube channel within 48 hours. Go to youtube.com slash idea to IPO. Dr. Earl has some books. Uh, we're actually going to set them up outside in front of the check-in desk. He'll sign books. You can do a selfie with him. And it's only uh, 10 bucks, by the way. So, uh, and also, if you didn't have, sorry, oh, if you don't have money, take it and drop it on my PayPal account. I work on total trust. 
So you can always drop it on my PayPal account. My business cards are here if you want it. Everyone here is trustworthy, no problem. So anyway, uh, stick around, finish off the food. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time. Once again, thank you so much for inviting it's me. Applause.